Hello, and welcome to Williams Folks Everywhere. Thank you for coming together for this special program. I'm Megan Morey, the Vice President for College Relations, and I'm delighted to be here with you as we celebrate and mark 50 years of Williams Co-Education and the Society of Alumni Bicentennial. This Dwelling of the Gallant panel, which typically is a hallmark of our in-person reunion program, is one of a year-long celebration of events commemorating the 20, 200th anniversary of the founding of Williams College Society of Alumni. Our society is the oldest alumni association in North America and quite possibly in the world. We're spending this bicentennial year not only celebrating and grappling with our past, but also examining our present and imagining our future. Together, we envision an inclusive society where all alumni feel they belong. We are united in our shared commitment to a liberal arts education, to lifelong learning, and most especially to each other and to the college. Thank you. And a few reminders before we get started. If you have any questions during today's talk, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen at any time. We'll have dedicated time for Q&A toward the end of the program, but you can submit your questions as you think of them. Please reserve the chat as a space to engage with the community and share any reflections or comments you have. And remember to select all panelists and all attendees in the chat dropdown so that your message can be seen by all. And please note that we are recording today's session. And with that, I'd like to introduce our four incredible alumni. We are joined today by Meg Lohman, Williams Class of 1976. Meg serves as director of Tree Foundation and as a National Geographic Explorer. Called the Real Life Lorax by National Geographic and the Einstein of Tree Tops by Wall Street Journal, Meg, Meg, Meg is an author, explorer, scientist, arbornaut, which is translated to be a treetop explorer and change agent for conservation. She has devoted over three decades to exploration and research on treetop secrets as one of the first pioneers to launch Canopy Science as a museum leader. She has published nine books and her 10th, The Arbornaut, A Life Exploring the Eighth Continent is available this summer. Her recent projects include creating UNESCO World Heritage Forest Site for in Malaysia and partnering with Ethiopia, Ethiopia's Coptic priest to save their last 5% of the remaining church forests. Adrena Eiffel, Williams Class of 1991, is an award-winning communications entrepreneur and producer who connects storytelling and advocacy. As CEO of Eiffel Doubleback Global Group, Adrena has written and directed several historical films and managed multiple digital humanities projects. She is consulting as the film planning project manager to support the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site within the National Park Service. Her initial inspiration came from her parents who filled their home with personal stories and black history books. A graduate of Williams, Howard and George Washington, she was most recently a 2020 AAD Humanities Scholar at the University of Maryland. Adrena participates on several educational and philanthropic boards, including serving as the current board chair for the Holton Arms School in Bethesda, Maryland. Jai Young Pon, Williams Class of 2006, has been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2016. Her writing and reporting on China, American politics and culture has appeared in the magazine and on the newyorker.com since 2010. Her haunting and powerful New Yorker essay, How My Mother and I Became Chinese Propaganda, published last year, describes how she and her mother became the target of a nationalist propaganda and harassment as she sought to get her mother the care she needed during the COVID lockdown. Jiang is currently at work on her first book, Motherland, to be published in 2023. And Jessica Bernheim, Williams Class of 2016. Jessica serves as the head of new product development for North America at Upfield, a global plant-based food company where she has worked since 2018. And she was responsible for spearheading the launch of Country Crock Plant Butter. While at Williams, Jessica co-founded Kinetic, a student-led action-oriented think tank, which became one of the largest student organizations on campus. 
Jessica led a team focused on food insecurity and sustainable agriculture and worked with local community stakeholders to design and implement initiatives such as suspended groceries and roots rising. We are so pleased to have you all here today. And I'd like to now to invite Meg to the virtual stage as we begin our program. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you, everybody, and a special shout out to the class of 76. I'm the dinosaur in this talk, I realize, the oldest class, but I'm still so honored to be here and with this illustrious panel to tell you my very humble story. Technically, I am a professional arbornaut, whereas astronauts explore outer space, arbornauts climb to the tops of those trees right above your head, and lo and behold, it's a whole new world that we never knew about until perhaps I became an arbornaut in 1976 when I graduated from Williams. Um, as I look back upon my experience as the second class of women at Williams, I realized that what I gained from that experience was not just a love of trees, which is indeed true, but also a core value and a passion for diversity, which in turn, I think, links very closely to environmental stewardship. So I'd like to tell that story very quickly. Looking back on my youth, I realized in high school, I wanted to go to a college that had a forest. So I went to my rural small town public high school guidance counselor and said, I'm going to apply to Williams. And he said, surely you mean William and Mary. There is no such college as Williams. So in the good old days, I guess we weren't on the map as much as we are now. And I did ultimately persist and ended up turning down Princeton to come to Williamstown because it looked like a much better geographic Geographic location to find trees, as well as a lot of cows, I think. My pursuit of science turned out not to be as seamless as I had anticipated. I started out in biology, of course, but was surrounded by pre-med students and lots of lectures about cells. So I thought maybe I should study geology and figure out where trees grow and what kind of substrate they live on. So I enthusiastically went across the quad to the geology building and lo and behold, found out from the senior professor that women were not going to be welcome in the cafeteria stone course. So those were the days when we just kind of tiptoed back out again and I returned to biology and quietly became a handful of the very few students that did use Hopkins Forest and major in field biology, things other than pre-med. I have to give a shout out to Tom Jorling, who was at the time the Director of Environmental Studies. He was a great mentor to a lot of us who wanted to dedicate our lives to making the planet a better place. And he certainly was a wonderful role model for so many of us. After Williams, I thought, well, this will be great. I'll go to a more co-educational school than the ratio of Williams in those days when I attended. And so I went off to Duke excitedly into the forestry school with a scholarship, but lo and behold, was the only woman in the classroom. And eventually I ended up at Sydney University where I was the only woman in the graduate program. And the head of the department in Australia at Sydney University called me in very gently and kindly and said, Meg, what are you doing? You'll only get married and have children. Why bother with this PhD thing? So that was, of course, the late 70s. And those were the days when William, uh, women just didn't do those kind of things. And so I kind of tiptoed around and was determined to at least see a koala, even if I flunked out and did persist over at Sydney University. Somehow I bumbled my way through a lot of heroic tomboy adventures. I welded a slingshot and sewed a harness and ended up being one of the first people to climb tall trees and figure out that half of the biodiversity in the world lives up there. So it was kind of exciting and fun, even if it was perhaps considered a boy's sport in Australia at the time. And I did go on and have children in Australia and lived in the outback again, where women were supposed to be in the kitchen so it was, I guess, a time for me where that word diversity was really important. Suddenly I found myself surrounded by a homogeneous audience of men and really wanted to push for more inclusion in my world of science. So I did eventually return to the States to raise my boys. Uh, I had a wonderful time as a visiting professor at Williams and went on to a museum career, as Megan mentioned. 
Uh, I took two Fulbright scholarships and went to both India and Ethiopia to mentor women in those countries. And what a sobering experience. Here were places up in Assam and also in rural Ethiopia where of course girls never had opportunities to even go to college, much less develop a career. So it was really challenging for me to think how could I use my scientific career, which rewarded me for publishing technical papers for mostly English speaking scholars and figure out a way to make a better difference on the ground in many of these developing countries. I observed in a lot of my jungles how the indigenous women were really the true environmental stewards. They absolutely knew about the pollinators, how to plant the garden, how to find fresh water, and yet they were never at the decision-making table. So I started advocating for them and bringing activities to professionalize them, taught them to climb trees, brought books in their own languages, gave training courses, did whatever I could to give those women a better voice because it did make me realize how fortunate I was to have a degree from Williams College and somehow bumble my way through even a world where women were not always welcome in science. To reach the treetops, I ended up designing a lot of tools. One of them was a canopy walkway. I built the first one in Australia and returned to Williams and built the first one in North America in my beloved Hopkins Forest. So it today serves as an amazing model for construction that is now going on in forests around the world. Uh, two years ago, I was so privileged to lead the class of 76 field trip to the Amazon. So with 36 of my classmates, they got down and dirty into the best tropical jungles of the world and came home and we have launched a program called Mission Green to build walkways like Williams in the 10 most uh, degraded force of the world that have the highest biodiversity. So stay tuned as even us older classmates might get our act together and try to make a global difference in helping women get jobs, in this case for ecotourism and helping forests get conserved. Um, one thing along my journey that surprised me was there were a lot of other places in the world where I didn't see diversity at the decision-making table. And one of those was the physically disabled. So I dedicated quite a lot of the last 10 years of my career to creating programs for mobility limited students. And I bugged the National Science Foundation so much that they finally funded me to start the first field biology program for mobility limited students. And my kids in wheelchairs discovered new species in oak trees in Massachusetts and Kansas. So it just shows you that it's possible for that kind of thing to happen. And also along the way, I named my first new species after Williams College. It's called the gull beetle. It's found in Antarctic beech trees all over the rainforests of Australia and New Zealand. And lo and behold, I guess some people endow buildings and professorships, but field biologists maybe name a new species after their favorite college. And so that was one of my early gifts to Williams. So in closing, I'd just like to say that those hallowed halls of science at Williams in the early 1970s, where females rarely tread, imprinted me with a huge conviction to prioritize diversity and combine it somehow with environmental stewardship. I think my own personal experiences really inspired me to make inclusion a priority in my professional activities. I was fortunate to be the director of the North Carolina Nature Research Center, and I'm really proud that I staffed that museum and we were the only arguably museum in the world with over 50% women senior curators. And mind you, they were the best qualified for the job. So that was a real honor. I then got recruited out to California to the 163 year old California Academy of Sciences, which had only one female curator and was asked to do the same thing all over again. And I can only tell you that even in the recent past, it was not easy to change a culture of an institution that was very conventional in a lot of its thinking. And hopefully all of that's summarized in my forthcoming book, as Megan mentioned, The Arbor Knot, which comes out in two weeks and where I hope my misadventures might help William students, uh, both male and female benefit from looking to the past and seeing all of those hurdles that those of us in the last generation might have faced. 
Um, so in closing, I wanna give a clarion call to my classmates and all of the other classes at Williams. Two actions I think are critical. One is demand diversity at every decision-making table where you sit. And number two is save big trees. I know that sounds a little ordinary, but I think if we can make sure that the planet is a better place for our children, it will be the best inheritance they can ever have. So I wish all of you the best and hope that we will convene again in person. And I'm really so honored again to Lila and Megan and all the group for having me on this panel. Thank you so much. And I'm now so honored to turn the next microphone over to Adrena, class of 91. Thanks, Meg. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And I want to thank the college for inviting me to speak to you all today. I'm delighted to do anything Williams related and especially excited given it's my reunion year. I also want to acknowledge those who've worked on these events, those alumni who came before me and positively impacted the school I love and the current students who are making it even better. And I also want to give a moment of reflection to the indigenous Mohican people on whose land Williams College sits and those people who were enslaved and served the college during the founding and early days. There has been tremendous conversation over the last few years about access and belonging. In preparing for this program, I took some time to search Williams related topics, talk to classmates and yes, look at old photos. Some were funny, some were sober. What seemed true then and still remains true for me is that Williams is my school. Way back when I arrived in Williamstown in the back seat of my parents' Buick. It was full of linens, shoes, notebooks in every shade of purple. And I will never forget driving up to the front of Layman and being anxious to meet my new classmates and find my SU box. It was here I belonged. All those years later, <clears throat> I still think back about how Williams has always been a part of my life. My father attended Howard University where he studied with Sterling Brown, the renowned poet and Williams graduate of 1992. And most importantly, my favorite color is purple. My most poignant access point was the weekend I visited as a prospective freshman. Driving from the Albany airport with my mother, I was struck about how much she loved it. And she was the smartest person I knew. So I had a sense that adventure awaited me. Over the following three years, every year, I would be anxious for a variety of reasons as I traveled into the Purple Valley. But I knew I had friends who had become like family to keep me going all the way to graduation, the finish line but I wasn't finished with Williams. Truly, it was four years that is still shaping my life. It was my Williams, my way. What I thought my career would be is far from what it is today in name. I produce, promote, preserve, and, pro and promote and preserve cultural and legacy content using technology and media to advocate for more accessible narratives. I must give credit to Professor Reginald Hildebrand for solidifying my passion to preserve Black history. I built a business that produces documentary films and live events, digitizes archival materials, and consults on communication strategy. I can say that Williams nurtured these ideas in classrooms with inclusive faculty and providing safe spaces such as Rice House. Over the last 30 years, I have lived in three major cities and worked on hundreds of history-based projects. And throughout this time, I've always drawn on my Williams experience. Navigating the south side of Baxter at lunch prepared me to enter any room and claim my space. Studying in the library and finding the right Carol to hide out until I wanted to be found prepared me to succeed at remote work as an entrepreneur. I'm relaxing on Chapin Beach during the few but important sunny days around exam time. Remind me to regularly 
find time to be outdoors whenever possible. I also remember as a freshman taking an advanced computer science course with a young male professor who was unwilling to respond to my inquiries and requests for help in spite of the fact that I showed up for office hours repeatedly. His inability to access important teaching skills to instruct the only female student in the class was harsh and squashed my dream to minor in computer science. In reality, it was not the only time that Williams proved to have inaccessible points. I belong there and no one or nothing was going to change that. I can say as a black woman, access is on my mind daily in ways that inside the Williams bubble, some often take for granted. In certain spaces, when I'm introduced by my resume or affiliated by someone of note, I have found looks of surprise or nods that open minds and hearts. But really nothing has changed except their perception. I remain the same. Claudia Rankin, alumni of class of 1986 and a fellow Antillian American, her representing Jamaica, me, Trinidad and Tobago, speaks to this in her writings. In Citizen, an American, lyric, an American Lyric, she writes, a friend argues that Americans battle between the historical self and the self-self. By this, she means you mostly interact as friends with mutual interest. And for the most part, compatible personalities. However, sometimes your historical selves her white self and your black self, or your white self and her black self, arrive at the full force of your American positioning. Then you are standing face to face in seconds that wipe the affable smiles right from your mouths. What did you say? Instantaneously, your attachment seems fragile, tenuous, subject to any transgression of your historical self. And through your joint personal histories, and though your joint personal histories are supposed to save you from misunderstandings, they usually cause you to understand all too well what is meant. Last summer brought a racial reckoning again. I remember my freshman year when I was part of a protest at Jeunesse House, listening to, to upper class students talk about the importance of a more representative faculty, inclusive student recruitment, and access to curriculum. All the things that gave equity a center stage in my educational journey. The shared Williams experiences, language, traditions, and the fact that we all must take trains, planes, and automobiles to get to campus unifies us no matter where we are in the world and from what decade. In 2019, I presented at Cara Festa, a regional cultural and arts festival, which was held in Port of Spain, Trinidad. I reached out to the network there and met alums at a local Starbucks. It was fantastic. I even was invited to talk to prospective students during those three days. Throughout the years, I had run into schoolmates randomly at the theater, on the school bus, on the Metro bus, <laughs> waved hello to parents whose cars displayed the purple cow. And even yesterday, I found out a new associate is spending the summer in Williamstown working with the library on the Sterling Brown, Sterling Brown archives. This is my Williams, my way. I have high expectations of Williams. So I will always remain involved so that generations to come meet and experience a Williams more accessible where they know they belong from their first encounter. Their Williams, their way. Thank you. And now I will pass the mic to Jayun Fawn. Hi, thank you so much um, for having me. This is my um, reunion year, so I'm especially grateful um, to the college for um, inviting me. Um, my, the first time I met Williams College was actually through the cover of one of its, of one of its um, alumni magazines. 
it was a black and white photo of students sitting in a circle, presumably during class on a manicured patch of grass against the backdrop of um, pastoral serenity that we all know so well. I think I was 14 or 15, still a fairly new immigrant to this country. And I couldn't imagine myself in the photo, even as I realized how much I wanted to be a part of it. A few years later, um, when Williams gave me the most generous financial aid package of all the schools that I applied to, the choice was clear about where I would attend college, but it wasn't so clear to me how I would fit into the picture of the Purple Valley. I felt a, de a desperation to reinvent myself and um, to leave, and also to leave myself behind while trying to fit a new self into the frame of my new surroundings. What did I want from this education? I want to say that I could have done anything I wanted, but the truth was that I wasn't very good at many of the new things I imagined for my new self. I wanted to be good at something that I never tried, like music theory, but never got around um, uh, to trying, you know, even an introductory class. I sucked at economics, <laughs> the most popular major uh, the year I graduated. I would not become a banker or a consultant. Um, I was an English and philosophy major, uh, mostly because the only thing I could really do was ask myself the same questions on the page over and over again. What is, what's a person's relationship to the world? And what values should that relationship be anchored? How should a person transform the world even as she is being transformed by it? For four years, I had the good fortune of being in the presence of teachers who were never less than patient and encouraging as I groped my way feebly toward answers that felt like making a path as I was walking along it. This is more or less what I continue to do after college as I spent a few years procrastinating against entrance into the real world. In many ways, I felt like an infant who had been unceremoniously kicked out of the womb. Sometimes I blamed Williams, which felt like that womb that enabled um, uh, the kind of you know, coddling um, uh, and resistance um, against um, actual fully entering the real world. Why hadn't it equipped me with any practical skills? Why did the career counseling office not warn me about how unfit I was for the real world and how unwanted I would be in it. I was just as angry at, I was just as angry at myself and my sense of being adrift and unmoored. My deepest impression of those years is restlessness and desperation. This time not to enter the circle on the manicured grass, um, in that photo on the cover of the alumni magazine, the crawl back into the womb of the purple bubble. In that time, I was also trying unsuccessfully to write. I had no real conviction that I would ever write for a living. My confidence was fragile, but if I had any at all to keep me going, it lived in the place within me that remembered the safety and tenderness of the last place I had found it, the classroom. That in the, and also that in the years when I was the most unformed and hungry and impressionable, I was nurtured and valued. This, is, this of course is very different from flashing your Williams degree as an all access pass to the job of your dreams at 21 or you know, 23 or 27. I remember dozens of form emails I sent to Williams alums after graduation during unhinged attempts to find jobs in sectors for which I had no qualification or really, to be honest, any interest even because I thought that was what I was supposed to do. Thank goodness no one was insane enough to give me a job on the basis, on the basis of my being part of the EVE network. Part of a Williams education is also discernment. And yet few days go by when I don't think about the path of my education and how it began orienting me toward the world. 
not only as a writer, but as a person. There's a way in which as a writer, you're always examining your alienation from the world around you and chasing the questions in your head with an oversized butterfly net. It's lonely, maddening, and exhilarating. To do it, you have to have some illogical confidence that it's a worthy project. I think that's what Williams gave me, the conviction, however unfounded, that I can find my relationship to the world through the questions I ask and the stories I attempt to tell. I still think about that alumni magazine cover. I think about how far I've traveled from that story of Williams to the one in which I now live. The part of me that wants to crawl back into the womb of the purple bubble now feels the responsibility of building a shelter and refuge for others. And I would like to think that this is the most important part of a good education, that when you emerge from it, you're transformed into a person who loves the place that formed you, even as you know that the real work of transforming the world has to take place outside it. Thank you so much. Um, and I would just like to um, introduce Deuce, um, Jessica, um, uh, and um, as our next speaker. And um, again, thank you. Thank you so much to my fellow panelists for the very thoughtful words. I am honored to be here today at an event that celebrates Williams women. I graduated from Williams in 2016, and in this virtual audience are some of my dearest friends. Thank you all for being here. I wanna talk about a few experiences that shaped my time at Williams and have had a profound impact on my professional life since. In particular, I wanna tell you about how Williams empowered me to view my passion for food as a real career path. When I was a freshman living in Sage E, I met a few women with whom I started an organization called Kinetic. Kinetic was probably the most formative experience I had here at Williams. And I often think about how Kinetic is a true reflection of the uniquely special people that I met here. Kinetic is an action-oriented think tank in which student groups would come together to research, design, and implement systems changing initiatives to important social issues. In Kinetic, I led two teams, one focused on food insecurity and another focused on sustainable agriculture. Our food insecurity team designed and launched an initiative called Suspended Groceries. Suspended Groceries was inspired by the concept of suspended coffee, a tradition based in Naples, Italy, in which people in a cafe could purchase a coffee for themselves and suspend a coffee for someone in need. To suspend means to pay in advance for the coffee without taking it. In these cafes, a barista would mark on a chalkboard behind the counter when suspended coffees were available, and it would allow someone who couldn't afford a cup to come in and order one without making a big fuss. It was a dignified way to help out your community members going through a hard time. We decided to adapt this beautiful tradition to the grocery store. We partnered with Wild Oats Co-op in Williamstown to create a program in which shoppers could suspend any of five healthy perishable items, items which are less frequently available at food pantries. Each month, coupons would be created for these items and residents in the area could use these coupons to shop at Wild Oats. Over the course of its first five years, Suspended Groceries provided free access to nearly 3,000 food items, and it continues to serve approximately 50 people in the Berkshires area every month. Our sustainable agriculture team designed and launched an initiative called Roots Rising in partnership with a local community organization called Alchemy Initiative. Roots Rising is a program that hires young teens from Pittsfield, Mass to work at food pantries, farms, and the Pittsfield Farmers Market. Students also engage in workshops, culinary lessons, and financial literacy classes as part of their overall experience. The program empowers young people to get involved in their community, and by paying students for their work, it allows students who would otherwise need an after-school or summer job to participate. Both programs centered around the power of food, to nourish, feed, engage, and teach. And in these programs, my kinetic teams and I had the opportunity to work with community stakeholders in and around our Williamstown home. Through kinetic, I learned how to manage a team, lead a group of individuals, and collaborate with people who had different backgrounds, perspectives, and skills than I. 
we believed passionately in our ability to empower students and make change. And along the way, we made some pretty incredible friends and accomplished some very exciting projects. I made many friends through Kinetic, but one of them I made in a very particular Williams way. Williams is a small school. And as you all know, everyone knows one another and people talk, even in the first few weeks of school. From this chatter, I had heard about one student who was supposed to be fantastic, a huge personality, very dynamic. She would be a real asset to our club, which in the first few weeks of school was only three of us. I spotted this girl in Pereski one day and I walked straight up to her. I introduced myself and I told her she should join Kinetic. She tells me that I literally pointed a finger straight at her and marched across the room to make my introduction. Mind you, I had never met her before, but now she's one of my best friends and she's off to France in a few months to start her next adventure. This kind of story is very emblematic of my time at Williams, making friends easily with smart, interesting people who went on to shape the next four years of my college experience and play a big role in my life after graduation. Food had always been a big passion of mine. I discovered a food blog in high school called Smitten Kitchen, which I read religiously every day. I would spend hours in the Barnes and Nobles near my house in the food memoir section. I would fight with my brother over who was the better baker, and I would take cookbooks out of the library to page through. I never considered food as a real career though. It was my hobby, and I figured politics would be my career. But one summer in college, I went on a self-designed food tour with my friend Zatio another fantastic Williams friend. And while we were walking under a bridge somewhere in Brooklyn, between our stop at a Jewish Montreal style deli and a bakery, Zatio said to me, you're so passionate about food. Would you ever consider doing this for real? I remember saying, definitely not. That's my hobby. And it's just not intellectual enough to be my career. I felt like what I did after Williams should have a similar academic rigor to my years in school and be a meaty kind of career in politics, law, or business. However, despite that separation between church and state, during my time at Williams, food continued to play a big part in my experience. I spent two summers working in politics. I interned for New York Senator Gillibrand and for New York City Mayor de Blasio. Both experiences were fascinating in different ways, and yet they both found their way back to food. One of the reasons I was so excited to intern for Senator Gillibrand was because she sits on the Agriculture Committee and the Agriculture Committee oversees food insecurity programs. I was thrilled to be able to listen into hearings and take notes and learn from the team who got to work on the annual Farm Bill. When I interned for the New York City Mayor, I met his food policy director in an elevator. I didn't even know that food policy was a job you could have. After introducing myself to her and telling her about Kinetic, I went with her to a number of food related events around the city, which I loved. My experiences at Williams, particularly freshman and sophomore year, helped me realize that my hobby could and should be a part of my career, that my passion for a subject would make my career and my life so much happier and more fulfilling. My experience in Kinetic, working on food insecurity and sustainable agriculture, allowed me to see food as not just a frivolous and fun subject, but as a multidimensional, rich, and indeed intellectual subject in which policy, innovation, culture, and the act of making and eating were all connected. At a very academic institution, a lot of my time ended up being about food. My Williams experience helped me to see food as a real path and it shaped my years out of school. After Williams, I spent two years in management consulting at Parthenon EY. I worked in New York City on the edge of Times Square on a range of commercial due diligences for private equity clients and longer term strategy projects for corporate clients. I learned how to use Excel and PowerPoint, but more importantly, I learned how to think about different markets, how to ask key questions to understand a new industry, a competitive landscape, and trends in the space. I was a generalist, so I worked on cases for clients invested in healthcare, education, and consumer. While I was there, though, I did my best to get on the consumer projects. In fact, one of my favorites was a diligence I did for a vitamin company because my role was to speak to buyers at natural food stores and understand trends in the wellness space. These cases reinforced a growing sense that I should be working in a field about which I was passionate. And after two years, I decided to look for my next role and I focused my search exclusively on mission-driven food companies. Now I work for a company called Upfield. Upfield is the largest plant-based food company in the world. 
We make plant-based breads, plant-based but plant-based butters, and plant-based cheeses. I lead new product development for North America, and I'm specifically working on the launch of plant-based creams. In this role, I lead cross-functional teams of food scientists, supply chain managers, and packaging engineers. As part of my role, I do research on the size and growth of different markets. I work with our R&D team to develop a product formula brief, and I work with creative agencies to design packaging, develop a brand identity, and put together a communications plan. I've had some very cool experiences at Upfield. I've traveled to an animal sanctuary outside of Toronto to meet Esther the Wonder Pig and Anthony Porowski to shoot content about the connection between plant-based eating and animal welfare. I partnered with local bakeries during COVID to give back. I've traveled to Expo West, the largest natural food and beverage convention in the United States to taste about 2000 different samples of the newest plant-based products, chips, sparkling water, you name it. And I've developed a reputation for knowing my stuff when it comes to food. As it turns out, when your hobby is to read Bon Appetit, shop at farmer's markets, cook, bake, and eat at all the cool new restaurants, you're a real asset in a food company that's trying to modernize and innovate. My time at Kinetic was actually the best career preparation I could have asked for. And my time at Williams, growing my passion in food and expanding it from a love of cooking and eating to an interest in food insecurity, sustainable agriculture, and culture more broadly has made me a better contributor and a more thoughtful leader. It turns out that food can be quite intellectual. A few lessons I've learned so far. Listen to yourself, the work you're interested in, the things you talk about with your friends, with your family, the articles you gravitate towards, these are the things you actually wanna be doing with your life. You spend eight to 12 hours a day at your job. It's so much more interesting when you care about the field you're in. You're better at your job when you're passionate about the subject. And more importantly, or and most importantly, intellectual doesn't have to mean a traditional career in finance, law, or politics. You can find stimulating, engaging, and indeed intellectual work in many, many fields, including food. It was an incredible experience to attend Williams, to help build Kinetic, to make and develop such meaningful relationships with my friends and professors. My time since graduating has been shaped so profoundly by my time at Williams, and I'm so grateful to have had these magical four years here. Thank you. Wow, Meg, Adrena, Jayan, Jessica, you are amazing. Just wonderful, wonderful remarks. Thank you. These reflections are really um, give us all a lot to think about and, and also to be proud of. Um, so we have time for some questions and I'm gonna throw one out to begin and feel free to use the Q&A uh, box to, to field your question. So um, somebody asked, who or and this is this is for all of you who or, or what helped you find that inner conviction to pursue what you loved maybe meg we'll start with you sure yeah that was such a great question i guess at age three i started climbing trees because i was so shy and let's face it plants don't talk back they don't bully you they don't demand much and i did grow up in rural america at a time when we didn't have a lot of indoor technology so that probably sealed the deal for me and it did give me an inner conviction especially in current days as a mom i say this more than as a scientist some a lot of these important forests are burning disappearing being cleared for our consumption in north america so it gives me a lot of passion to speak out about it thanks for asking okay jessica I think in terms of you know my inspirations, I have the most incredible parents and, and my mom really showed me what it means to be um, a powerful businesswoman. But I think my interest for food sort of came from my love of eating. Um, and I love to eat since I was a little kid. You know, my grandma tells a story of taking me to a restaurant at two or three and ordering roasted salmon and, and eating very peaceably, very happy to be at you know, a nice restaurant. Um, and I think as I just got older, I, I engaged in the subject more and more, um, first through cooking and baking, and then really when I got to Williams and really understood how food interacted with the community around me, um, that's what pushed me to, to take it further. That's great. Adrena? Yeah, I would, I would echo what Jessica said, my parents, really. I think they were, you know, they set me on the right path and then they kept 
pushing and inspire me and, you know, expecting the best and I just couldn't let them down. So I would definitely say that they continue to be my inspiration too as well. Cheyenne? Um, <laughs> I think my inspiration is I literally don't know what else I would be doing. I don't know if that's an inspiration or just um, or if that's just desperation. Um, I think uh, I, I honestly, um, I'm just not sure what else I'm qualified to do. Um, so, so I think I'm just, I th so I think, I think I'm just stuck doing the thing, which is kind of writing and turning in papers that, um, you know, I've done since I was 18. <laughs> so another question is, what advice would you give to young alumni who are making their way in the world? Maybe we'll go backwards and I'll, I'll just, Adrena, why don't you start? Sure. Um, uh, I would say that the key thing is to really, to, to figure out what you're really good at, right? And then focus on that. So if you're a great writer, then you're going to continue to do those, those things, whatever industry you're in you'll find a way to write and that'll be something that you'll love to do. And then you want to continue to do that. And also to ask for help whenever you need it. You know, don't be afraid. If someone's not gonna give you help, that's their issue. It's not because you asked. And continue to ask because that's gonna get you further and that's going to actually make this whole life journey experience much better. That's great. Jayan? I think, um. Uh, you know, a combination of um, kind of um, confidence and humility, which I'm still trying to, um, which is not an easy combo, um, uh, which I'm still trying to, to master myself, but confidence in the sense that um, it comes from, I mean, it comes from what forms you on the inside, um, not from, you know, external um, perception and approval, I mean, easier said than done. And humility also, I think, as a force that comes within you because um, you don't need to be, you know, humbled by um, other people's uh, disapproval. I think it's that sense that even when you see yourself as doing your finest work, you know that um, you're drawing on something inside you to, um, outdo yourself the next time around. Jessica? I think that at Williams, there is a lot of pressure to do sort of traditional paths. Um, you know, everyone goes into consulting, myself included. Um, and I actually do think it's a, it's a phenomenal first job and I learned a lot. But I think that as a student, you know, if that is something you're interested in, wonderful. But if it's something you're not interested in, you you don't always feel like you know what else exists out there. Um, and it's so wonderful to be sitting on a on a panel with women who have done such diverse things um, in the world, and and frankly, careers that I didn't even know existed when I was a student. And so I would say my advice is to reach out to Williams alums um, who have jobs that are interesting and maybe a little off the beaten path that you don't know about, and to talk to them. And I think that I would say as, as a young Williams alum, I am thrilled and really flattered when younger students reach out to me to ask about my job or to ask about how I thought about my first, you know, few roles outside of school. Um, and, and I would say, and you know, I don't want to speak for everyone here, but I'm sure most Williams alums are thrilled to, to get those kinds of questions, especially if it's just, you know, how did you think about what to do next? And, and how did you learn about what exists? Um, and to some extent, you know, you learn once you start working and, and that is good too. I love that. I love that you're plugging our mentoring program too. <laughs> I encourage everybody to, to take a look. Meg? Sure, I guess I would really still say that I think women need to help women. I still look at the world and there's something called the tall poppy syndrome where I observe sometimes women getting knocked back by men who are jealous of their success. And even though it looks like a wonderful playing field out there, I still think there are those ways. I remember in my younger days, looking at all of my fellow classmates who were in business and they played golf and they made deals and they 
you know, had success that way. And so my bucket list for retirement was number one, write a book about my misadventures, which I have done. And number two was to learn to play golf because I saw this as some secret male bastion of success. And I'm still waiting for someone to invite me to Augusta if you're out there, but I just feel like it's like so new to have this world where, you know, you can do some things and have hobbies and share it with your fellow colleagues. Um, but I think women have to still help women to succeed. And I am the mother of boys. Um, I'm all for boys succeeding, but I think girls need to help each other. What, um, somebody asked, what do you have a favorite course or faculty member from your days at Williams? Maybe start with Adrena. Um, well, I did mention um, Reginald Hildebrand, who I think he went on to UNC. Um, he was great. Um, I also had Stuart Clark, who was a visiting professor at the time and did my thesis and with him. Um, he was wonderful. Um, and I just, but I do, what I overall remember was even if I didn't have them as a sort of my major or my core subject or, and what the one thing I love about liberal arts education is because you can take a whole variety of things and it's not really all about your major is that no matter which classroom I went in, if it, even if it wasn't like geology or something and I was taking it, um, that pretty much you could really, they were accessible and you could learn something, even if it was just your just taking the sort of 101 version of the course. So I, I and, and since then have met a lot of Williams professors um, who've come after and have traveled around the country for alumni and always enjoyed listening to them. Jessica? I had many amazing professors, but I had one in particular that played a huge role in my Williams experience and that's Professor Garbrani, who is a history professor. And I actually met her when I was studying abroad. Um, I was a history major and I'm a Francophile and a foodie and from New York City and Professor Garbarini is all the same thing. So I thought really we were meant to be. And she was going to come back when I was gonna go abroad and we were gonna miss each other. And so I was very upset, um, but then she ended up staying another year out in Paris and we met out there and we really became very close. Um, She's really just an incredible professor and person. And I got to know her family. I babysat for her son. I you know, had lots of coffees and, and lunches with Professor Garbarini in Paris and then back in Williamstown. Um, my favorite course at Williams was her historiography course, which was actually the course I was, I was dreading because I thought historiography, that's not, you know, I like to learn stories about the past. I don't like to learn about the study of history. And it was actually the most phenomenal course I took. It really changed. It was that course that changes the way you think. Um, and I really credit Professor Garbarini and, and of course my classmates were amazing. Um, and I still keep in touch with Professor Garbarini. I just saw her a few months ago when I came up to Williamstown with some friends. So I just, you know, many professors, but she in particular is very special to me. That's great. Jayan? Um, what a dangerous minefield of a question um, uh, asking to name. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of all all my professors. So I think Scott Wong might be on this program. Too, <laughs> I know. Um, uh, <laughs> hi, Scott. Thank you so much for your note. Um, uh, of course, I you know I I, I remember um, his um, wonderful history class. Um, I mean, the first time I was actually introduced to um, Asian American history, but I think. Actually, you know, my favorite, you know, I think the reason I have such a hard time, you know, naming a favorite course or professor is that the experience of a Williams education is um, is one on one engagement, which I did not know was um, unique after graduating and the <laughs> and kind of um, the experience of, you know, of being taken seriously, no matter how half-baked your um, idea and um, is, and how utterly unoriginal, kind of your um, uh, your thoughts on a dead on a dead philosopher is. Um, I think that uh, the fact that it's hard for me to identify a single one is, I think, almost all my professors um, engaged with my ideas seriously, and um, and that is an aspect of um, a good. Kind of liberal arts education that um, really can't, you know, be found elsewhere, and which I, um, you know, have just reaped so much from. Okay. So now I'm really a dinosaur because guess what? I never had a woman professor in my whole career, so that just boggles my mind. And I did pay tribute to Tom Jorling and. 
course, we had Nat Lawrence in philosophy and John Huston who, in religion, who brought nature into their topics, but obviously couldn't really mentor me in my own field. So I had to dream about all the people that I worshipped personally, you know, Rachel Carson, who was dead, but she was a fabulous, you know, environmental writer. And Harriet Tubman was my role model because she was this amazing African-American lady that led people north on, you know, in the Underground Railway by feeling moss in the dark. And I thought she's got to be the coolest naturalist I've ever heard of, but she was long past. Um, and so when I came back as a visiting professor, I did teach a course that I created called The Role of Women in Natural History to try to bring out the fact that there could have been role models for women, and, but we didn't really think about it. Most of the textbooks are still filled with male scientists. And I will say out of that class, which entirely women signed up for, which is kind of funny, came my first book, um, Life in the Treetops. It got a cover review in the New York Times, but it's because my girls in that class said, Dr. Lauman, you have to write. If we're gonna write, you have to write with us. So we had a wonderful exchange of dialogue and it just reminded me that it, it, what a pleasure it is to have women professors, which I missed. So I had to try harder and be a good woman professor at the time. That's great. Or not so great. <laughs> <laughs> if you could go back to yourself as a first year at Williams, what advice would you give? You know, um, Jayan, any thoughts? Um, I think <laughs> um, look for courses that you literally do not like understand words in the title of. Um, uh, like I think because you, I mean, that, the fact that you have um, these years, especially the first years to experiment is a privilege and luxury you'll never have for the rest um, of your life. And so many, I mean, so many of us, I mean, especially me came in with this anxiety to be, um, you know, taking courses that made me feel like I was going to be an adult and that um, would be useful. I mean, this, you know, led to just um, uh, some, you know, again, econ courses that, um, you know, I, I clearly, uh, that, that was just not a good fit for me. So I, you know, I really regret not taking courses um, just uh, that I, I, I in fields that I didn't even, I couldn't even give you a definition of. And, um, and whenever high school students ask me, you know, what should I do in college? It's, um, I think is to, I mean, this is the time not to think about um, your future, <laughs> um, paradoxically, paradoxically, and to indulge your curiosity and to, um, you know, uh, embrace failure in things that actually, um, you know, energize you and intrigue you and, um, you know, pique your interest. Anybody else have anything to add on that question? I would just add one thing. I think the one of the most special things about a college experience is you're surrounded by so many incredible people who are so different than you. And I think when you go out into the workforce, you tend to mostly be with people who are very similar to you, same profession or similar background. And I think what's really special is if you can take advantage of just the incredible people at Williams to make friends with people who are different um, than you in, in interest, in background, um, in academic discipline. It makes for a much richer life when you graduate and you have all these amazing friends scattered around the world in different um, you know, professional disciplines um, to really to, to enrich your life afterwards. I love that. I guess I would add, just chime in and say, aside from eating honey buns at Baxter Hall, which is no longer called Baxter Hall, but that was such a wonderful tradition for us as freshmen. When I think back almost 50 years later, I really remember my winter studies that off campus. I think getting outside the wall, trying to push yourself to be global, taking advantage of those professors who dare to take you somewhere. I, I was so lucky to go to the Everglades one time, go to coral reefs another time. And, you know, as I think back to what really was so memorable, I don't really remember my exam in Economics 101 or, you know, my lectures in these great big lecture hall things, but I certainly remember those winter studies where a group of us, it's a lifelong friendship creation, as well as a daring professor took us somewhere different and we really had opportunities to see the world and that was just so special especially coming from Williamstown which is fairly parochial let's face it. <laughs>
Great advice. Adrena, anything to add? I was at, definitely going to say about winter study is like the best option to really explore and do those really small group um, adventures and take advantage of those as much as you can and create them as well. Not only the ones that are being offered, but Williams has so much opportunity for you to do your own project as you heard a lot of us talk about um, and create your own way. And, and, and that's, that's priceless really. Does anybody wanna to speak to this question that was asked? How do women help women in male dominated careers in which so few women rise to the top in the competition spheres? I guess I'll reiterate what I said before, which is women have to help women. I, I think, you know, I get so sad when I see women not helping women, I'll be honest, because I feel like there has to be some kind of sisterhood to, especially in science, to make it happen. And um, as I mentioned before, I'm just about to get hit by a thunderstorm, so I might go off the air in a minute. So that's why I answered first. <laughs> I would add to well, I would definitely echo Meg's point about that importance, but I would say tactically, there are a few things that I might recommend. I think when you're in a room with another woman and she makes a point to echo the point and to give credit to the person who spoke, like as you know, as Meg just said, that you know, what an excellent point, and I want to add, <laughs> and I think we should pursue it further. I think that helps, and I think that sometimes when you're starting out, you're nervous to ask questions. And you should spread your questions around. That was advice that I was given. So no one, no one person thinks, you know, oh, that Jessica, she's asking way too many questions. But I think, you know, finding some older women and, and asking them for help, um, you know, to get you up to speed on a specific thing or to teach you about something. And I think that is another way women can help women. And I would also add uh, that we, we also have to make sure that the men are, are taking it uh, accountability for this because they're in, in, some of them are enabling this as uh, as a way of, of practice and it's continuing on and if there are opportunities where they can take the responsibility and not do that in meetings or in sessions um, I think we've all especially on zoom seen sort of the what do they call the mantles where there's just all men panels or all something panels and um, there's a decision maker in there and there's people who are echoing that and they need to be um, accountable for that and recognize that and stop it so that we can not only if we pull each other up we can do that but that's only going to be 50 percent of the progress and yeah, i was just going to say that um uh what has helped me i think in the past is when um other women are able to share stories um, of, um, of, you know, their negotiation of, of, of um, their own career path. And also I think being frank about their vulnerabilities um, along the way. And um, I think that kind of helps to create um, an atmosphere of kind of safe, safety and shared experience rather than one of um, competitiveness. And also, I guess, knowing that just because um, you have had to kind of overcome unusual barriers um, doesn't mean the generation after you, you know, ha you know um, uh, would have to kind of walk as difficult a path. Um, the fact that, you know, part of our responsibility and duty um, is to make sure that it's not as, um, you know, you know, that, 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 path is not um, as impossible and um, and making sure you know it's not kind of a hazing process <laughs> um, you know that, that that's something I really take to heart. Good thoughts. Okay a question came in if you were to advise Williams on any diversity equity and access initiatives what would you recommend? Anyone? Well, I would recommend um, listening to the current students as much as possible and then taking action from there. Um, you know, it's been a while since I've been a student and I've been on campus, but I know that I can only imagine that there are issues um, so that in order to, to 
be not only a place of healing around those particular issues, but also as we sort of move forward and make it more inclusive so that inclusive inclusivity is an action as more less than a, a more than being just a descriptor that um, it's starting with the students and really taking what they're saying and um, bringing them to the table and making it sort of a partnership. Great. Anything else? I think it's also, um, you know, when I was at Williams, you know, 2006, um, I think there were, I mean, it was a much less diverse campus than it is now. And I think it's, um, it's, you know, I really appreciate William's effort in kind of, you know, diversifying um, uh, the student body. Um, I think just as important is the support that's given to um, students who are not accustomed to um, as rarefied a setting um, as Williams and making sure that they feel like they belong in this environment. Because I think that, I mean, the experience of being um, on this campus is such a, you know, rare and precious one. And you want um, uh, students who, um, have not kind of grown up with a lot of the privilege of, um, of you know, many other, um, you know, the majority of, I mean, of, of William students to feel like um, one of the advantages of being at Williams is having the resources to um, fully adjust. So I, I, I do feel like that's really an important part of um, uh, accommodating um, diversity. And um, I hope that, you know, continues, that effort continues and expands. Okay. Anything to add, Jessica? I think, I think my fellow panelists did a great job. I think the only thing I would maybe add is that um, it's really exciting as a student to see um, alums, whether, you know, that look like you or have similar, you know, backgrounds to you, doing interesting things out in the world. And one of my favorite things as a Williams student that really gave me real ideas about, especially as like a woman in the workforce, was um, a few different alums who actually came back and spoke. And um, I think it was in Dodd, they just were speaking about their careers and you know navigating being in the workforce as a woman and, and different ways they communicated to that to their family and their children. And um, that was really valuable to me. So that's, that's what I would add. So I think that um, that's, that's it for our questions. There is one here, um, Jayang, that was, somebody asked if, she said, Jayang, thank you for your wonderful talk, your words. I was making the path, I was walking along a path of discernment, really resonated with me as a female working, as a female working in a male dominated profession. I would very much like to quote you in a talk I'm giving to a group of female healthcare leaders. Is that okay with you? <laughs> of course, um, uh, thank you for being such a, a close listener and uh, um, and yes, I would be I would be honored to be quoted, of course. I think that's a good place to end. What an <laughs> honor it is. And it's been such an honor to spend an, a little bit of time this afternoon with all of you. And I'm sorry, I think we lost Meg to that thunderstorm. So um, <laughs> it's, but um, we, we thank you very much. You are truly, truly inspiring. And and I'm glad we've recorded this. And we're definitely, it definitely gives me the thought that we need to be pushing this out to our current students because so much of what you talked about, I think will really resonate with them. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share all your reflections and thoughts with the EVE community. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. And just a reminder that there are more conversations and workshops and programs as part of the Society of Alumni Bicentennial. And we hope that you will engage in those. So thank you for joining us today and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.